Hello, and welcome to our weekly dialogue with Helga Zepp-LaRouche. She's the founder and chairwoman of the Schiller Institute. It's December 27th, 2023, and I'm Harley Schlanger, and I'll be your host. You can send us your questions and comments at questions at schillerinstitute.org, or you can post them on the chat page in the YouTube, on YouTube. Now, in, in spite of significant diplomatic activity, there was no truce over the Christmas period, no ceasefire, no respite from the ongoing bombardment of, of the Palestinian people in Gaza. You, Helga, put out a, a statement, Turn Swords into Plowshares, which is available uh, on our website, on the Schiller Institute website. And over the Christmas weekend, there were calls from a number of religious leaders, including Pope Francis, demanding a ceasefire and a peaceful resolution. Let me start by asking you, how, what is the significance of these calls and what now will it take to bring an end to this ongoing conflict? Well, <clears throat> the significance of it is, I think, a general spreading awareness that unless we do something about the growing power of the military industrial complex, even if we start the war in Gaza or the war in Ukraine, that they will find another war, as they have found many wars before, Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria, Libya, and about, I think, 55 wars around the globe in which the military industrial complex is involved in making lots of profit by selling lots of weapons. And, you know, while I'm not reducing the whole economic theory you know, of the financial system, the neoliberal system to the idea of the military industrial complex. Nevertheless, I think it's correct to say that it's the sort of the final stage of the money making profit maximization neoliberal model. Um, you know, I had once a very dear friend in India, JC Kapoor, who used to call this the armored consumerism. And if you remember Bush, uh, I think it was Bush Senior, who at the occasion of one of the Iraq wars, I think it was the second Iraq war, said that the United States had to do this in order to protect, quote, the American lifestyle, meaning, you know, that the United States belongs to what they call in Russia, the golden billion. And, you know, that the continued poverty of many billions of people in the world is being perpetuated, you know, by simply, you know, having a system whereby only some nations in the past were allowed to process raw materials, to have value added production. <clears throat> and that in that way, a system was perpetuated, which, you know, kept colonialism uh, for hundreds of years in place. And even after the so-called independence of the colonial, former colonial states, colonialism did continue to exist. Now, in order to maintain that system, you know, which only allows the well-being and, and profit of a relatively small portion of the population, namely the speculators, those who are either directly involved in the military industrial complex or in the related uh, financial corporations which run these uh, <clears throat> uh, military firms in Wall Street and the city of London, that is the system which generates these wars and increases the killing for, you know, profit's sake. So, you know, the more you look at that, the more you think about it, it is very clear <clears throat> that the old demand from the Bible, I think it's from Jes uh, Jesuit, um, 2.4, uh, uh, that one needs to turn swords into plowshares. And there's another formulation, which I don't know now the English uh, for, but basically the same idea, that that is very, very relevant because all of this military production is a pure destruction of physical wealth. And, you know, even President Eisenhower, when he left office, said, that every plane produced, every bomb produced, takes something away from, you know, the people in terms of hospitals, kindergarten, and, and other useful things. 
So I think it has come to a point where we really have to demand in earnest that the military industrial complex be retooled, that these firms, which in part have extremely high technology capacities, can produce something useful. Uh, you know, all you have to do is make the political decision to do it, then take some, you know, design engineers, tell them here are the capacities, what can you, how long does it take to retool these and produce instead of F-515, F-16, F-35 bombers or missiles or other military goods, what does it take to retool these industries to produce fast train systems, you know, which can go 350 kilometers an hour, soon 600 kilometers an hour like the Chinese are doing or other useful things, uh, you know, including uh, really high technology areas in the nuclear field. In other words, you could use all of this productive capacity to produce what is so urgently needed in the world. This, however, does need uh, a political mobilization because, you know, that's not going to be a voluntary um, act by the owners of the military industrial complex uh, to, to do this. But, you know, given the fact that society is falling apart, I think there will be a growing demand. And therefore I was, you know, I, I wrote my Christmas message just thinking about it. And, you know, then I was extremely encouraged when I listened to the Angelus prayer of Obi et Orbi of the message by the Pope, uh, you know, for, for Christmas, where he made exactly the same point. He said that people have to know who makes the profit from these uh, military productions because it takes away from, from their well-being. So he had exactly the demand to name the names of the military industrial complex and to uh, basically turn swords into plowshares. So you know, I, I was very encouraged because, you know, and there are obviously many Christian groups like Pax Christi in America who are already since quite some time, you know, making that argument very strongly. But I think we are now we, we are now reaching the point where the connection between the terrible destruction going on in Gaza, which is unbelievable to even think that this should happen in, in, in this time and age, or even the situation in Ukraine, which becomes more terrible by the day as well, that has to stop. And we have to make a worldwide mobilization you know, along these lines, uh, what I said in my Christmas message and what obviously very independently Pope Francis uh, choose to make the topic as well. So I would really ask you to take these three, um, you know, the my Christmas message leaflet. We have a short leaflet where we basically say, you know, who is running uh, the military industrial complex from Wall Street and what has to be done to retool it and a slightly longer fact sheet. So you can take these three pieces of information and help to spread it as far as you can and join our mobilization uh, to, to have this kind of change. Well, that statement was, is available on the website. It's military financial corporation is bloated from blood money from wars. Uh, that's available, and, and your Christmas message is also available at the Schiller Institute website. Now, on, on continuing on the same topic, we have a note from a viewer in Ohio who referred to the statement from the Israel Defense Forces Chief of Staff, Halevi, who said the war will continue for many months. This in spite of the UN Security Council resolution, in spite of uh, the U.S. telling the uh, Israelis, they should wrap it up soon. Uh, he asked the question, does the UN Security Council have any enforcement power? Well, not as such. I mean, we have seen in the past that the United States vetoed uh, repeatedly the demand uh, or, you know, resolutions for a ceasefire and, you know, unless there is massive 
political pressure coming from the United States primarily, but also around the world. I don't think the UN Security Council, unfortunately, does not have such powers. However, I have my doubts that this will continue for many months. First of all, because the situation on the ground is so absolutely dire, the, according to UN organizations like the World Health Organization, the World Food Organization, they are saying that there are hundreds of thousands of people, if not two, if not two million, uh, who are affected by an acute famine. In other words, these are people who have nothing to eat tomorrow, the day after tomorrow, maybe some little something on the third day, then nothing again, up to the point of starvation. Now, this cannot go on for months. I mean, either there is a change or it is a complete elimination of all Palestinians living in Gaza. That's what we are looking at. And that has not gone unnoticed by the rest of the world. Just think about all the Islamic uh, countries of the world, or the Arab countries, not, not only that, the entire global south is looking at that. And what do they see? Well, they see on the on the one side what the IDF is doing, but you know everybody who's thinking about it a little bit realizes that nothing of this would happen unless the United States would provide the financial, military, and political support. And that is, you know, I think what has happened already is, I don't know what the right word is, you know, image damage, that's the mildest possible thing I can possibly say. You know, this is a stain which will not go away. And there are many articles in many parts of the world already which say that this is you know, a sign of the demise of the United States. And if there is no change coming from the inside of the United States, it could very well be that. And, you know, then naturally, there are so many other factors. There's the immediate danger of an enlargement of the war, uh, the attacks by Yemen on ships in the Red Sea, uh, squalls and, and skirmishes between Israelis and uh, Hezbollah on the, in the north, then the U.S. strikes into Iraq, which found a big protest by the Iraqi government. So this whole thing is a powder keg, <clears throat> and therefore, you know, the, the proposals for peaceful negotiations to bring this to an end, which fortunately are also circulating, like Egypt has made a proposal then there seems to be a proposal which was published only by a remote Palestinian website, then picked up by an Israeli website. But it includes, uh, you know, a whole series of demands, a pause, um, an exchange of uh, prisoners. And there, very importantly, is mentioned the leader of the PFLP, uh, Sadat, and the uh, Palestinian leader who is now in jail since 20 years, Marwan uh, Baghouti, who is recognized by the entire you know, international community, but especially all the Palestinian factions, that he should be released in the next prisoner exchange as the one person who could unify the Palestinians and have an agreement leading to a peaceful solution. So we should definitely all discuss this question of Barghouti, uh, the need to have him released as a sign, as a symbol of hope that there is a diplomatic solution possible. So I would ask all of you to join in our campaign to demand his release, because he is uh, a person who is definitely respected. And you know, that that would be a sign you know, that a solution can be found. Well, we did have a couple of people who wrote in and asked about Barghouti, and uh, you just answered that. But it's also noteworthy that as early as 2004, when he was first put in prison, uh, your husband said that his release would be urgently needed to have a, a partner in peace from the Palestinian side. And that's probably why he's been kept in prison. Now. You mentioned earlier the, the problem of colonialism. We have a question that just came in 
Uh, do you consider the U.S. to be functioning as a colonial superpower? Well, <clears throat> I think it is something of that sort because, you know, the U.S. right now controls to a very large extent NATO. Um, they control the European Union. Uh, the European Union has lost all sovereignty, if it ever had any. And naturally, you know, it is, you know, the role of the United States, which is being recognized as, you know, enforcer of the IMF, the World Bank and similar things. Now, let me just say this, you know, we have now the 27th of December. That means in three, four days, or four or five days, on the 1st of January, there will be a complete change in the strategic situation. That is the day when Russia will assume the chairmanship of the BRICS Plus. It will be the BRICS 10, including Ethiopia, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, the Emirates, and uh, Iran. So uh, that means a major change. Um, Foreign Minister Lavrov has uh, stated that the new BRICS is not going to be a formal organization with a secretariat and a bureaucracy, but it will be for a long time an association whereby every nation can maintain their own identity, their own sovereignty, their own way of doing things, their own path to development, but they will work together on a new paradigm for development of all. And at the recent Johannesburg summit, um, already 40 countries of the Global South <coughs> had expressed an interest to become a member soon. And <coughs> it's just a question of the speed and the modalities of the integration. But this is happening. And I think, you know, there is a tectonic shift going on. And I think people in the West who still are used to Eurocentric arrogance, and that includes the United States, which after all is a sort of a extension of the European civilization. Uh, th this Eurocentric view is completely outdated. That doesn't mean that all the proponents have realized that, but the rest of the world is moving very, very rapidly in a different direction. They want to have a just world economic order. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, for example, there's right now since Monday, <clears throat> the visit of the Indian uh, Secretary of Foreign Affairs, Jai Janka, uh, in Moscow, in, in Russia, rather. And uh, he met already many people from many walks of life, including he gave a joint press conference uh, with uh, Foreign Minister Lavrov. And they emphasized the extreme importance of the Russian-Indian relation um, that this is a very important, uh, you know, cornerstone of the future new paradigm. And this, despite the fact that there was a tremendous effort by the so-called Western democracies to pull India into the camp of the democracies, but that has not worked. India is an independent country, very obviously acting on the tradition of the non-aligned movement, and they have a deep friendship with Russia. And many, many African nations uh, also say that they have a deep friendship with Russia, which you know is going to be as deep and is becoming as deep again as it was during the time of the Soviet Union, because you know these countries realize who are their friends and who is giving them something in reality and who is just talking and making Sunday sermons. So I think that this coming year, while I do not discount the danger, as a matter of fact, the dangers are incredible. Nevertheless, there is all the reason of hope because when the majority of the world population is moving in a concerted way, in a different direction, saying that they want to build a just new world system, which allows for the development of everybody, I think this is unstoppable. I mean, the only thing which could stop it is World War III, but the possible instigator of such a war should think twice because they would not survive it either. So that may not be such a good idea. But I think there's reason for 
optimism because you know I think that the um, you know the history is reaching a point where the five or even six hundred years of colonialism is coming to an end, and I think that that cannot be reversed. Now we have a question also on this uh, danger of world war from a viewer in Thailand who writes, I've been hearing about the Thucydides trap as the cause, a potential cause of war between the US and China. I've heard this from many experts, including Chaz Freeman. What is the Thucydides trap and, and does it make war between the US and China inevitable? Well, <clears throat> not necessarily. I mean, the Thucydides trap is uh, named uh, according to the Greek uh, historian Thucydides, who developed this idea for the first time, that when uh, a new power is rising, uh, <clears throat> that then the power which is bypassed uh, sees it as a as a vital interest to to have war against this rising power. And he discussed this in the context of the Peloponnesian War between Sparta and, and Athens, which, as everybody knows, was the beginning of the device of Greece, from which it has never really uh, recovered. Uh, so that is the reference. And there are about, I think, 12 cases in history where a rising power replaced the previous top one, where it led to war. And there are about four cases where such a rise occurred without leading to war. And some people make out of that a theory um, as if that would be a natural given. Now, in the age of nuclear weapons, uh, the United States being the second largest nuclear power, China is becoming very rapidly the largest economic power. Militarily, they're still very much behind. But given their strategic relation with Russia, that is sort of uh, compensated. It should be clear to everybody that if it ever comes to war between the United States and China, that is as good as the end of the world. Because, you know, it is the logic of nuclear weapons that not one will be used, but a large enough arsenal uh, to cause the extinction of the human species. Now, Xi Jinping just made a speech in the context of the 130th anniversary of Mao Zedong, uh, where he said that China under no circumstances will allow a secession of Taiwan and that it will continuously push the peaceful unification. But he also made it very clear that those who are instigating a possible secession of Taiwan uh, have no chance of uh, doing that without having the extreme consequences to bear. Now, I think we are in a very dangerous uh, dynamic because, you know, the Turkish um, Foreign Policy Committee just voted uh, that Sweden can join NATO. Uh, this probably will lead now in the short term to a vote of the general parliament in Turkey. Um, Erdogan is uh, very much against it, but in, in Sweden, uh, I was just told today by some of our friends from Sweden, there is a debate that war with NATO, uh, between NATO and, and Russia, uh, including Swedish territory, is going to happen five years from now or whatever. And in Finland, similar voices, uh, articles have appeared saying that it will only take two years before you have a war involving Finland uh, with NATO and Russia. In Germany, um, there are think tanks, some scribblers, some absolutely irresponsible, I have to contain my language because I get really very angry when I, when I read stuff which can only lead to the destruction of civilization. And then these so-called experts, they say, yeah, we need to have a complete mentality change in Germany. We have to have a militarization of every pore of society. We have to discuss the war militarization in the clubs, in the city councils, in the state parliaments. Just every aspect of society has to be uh, made aware that soon 
we could have bloody corpses being carried through the villages again in the context of a war with Russia. This is so irresponsible. And I can only say, you know, that I can only ask all of you, our, you know, viewers and, and, and hopefully friends to join with us in a mobilization that this course of action is insane because it will lead to the destruction of the entire human species. I mean, there is no need to be an enemy of Russia or China or the global South. And the alternative to this kind of militarization of society is exactly what we talked about in the beginning, the retooling of the military industrial complex. And that again, naturally will only happen if there are enough forces uh, in the civil society demanding it, like farmers, trade unionists, entrepreneurs, uh, public officials, all kinds of people must really join this idea that, you know, are we the human species? Are we intelligent enough to prevent our own extinction or are we not? And that is why, you know, I think we have to really be extremely aware that this present idea of militarization of every aspect of society is, is absolutely suicidal and it should be replaced by the idea of cooperation among all nations in a new paradigm. Again, you can get Helga's statement, her Christmas message of turning swords into plowshares. That's available at the schillerinstitute.com and also our fact sheet on essentially what is the outline of the military financial complex and, and what are they funding and where are your tax dollars going instead of into infrastructure, healthcare, and so on? Uh, I, I have a question for you, Helga, from Pat, who refers to a, the rumors of a possible Wall Street crash in the beginning of the year. Of course, today it was announced by the German banking regulators that the German banking system is filled with uh, basically worthless paper, and the European Union is trying to figure out how to bail out the banks. What's your thought about uh, what we face with the financial system in, in the coming weeks and months? Well, <clears throat> I think we have both the American banks, but also the German banks now admitted by the Bundesbank sitting on unrealized losses. You know, you have a very high interest rate, uh, both in the United States and less so in Europe, but still very high. Uh, and that devaluates uh, a lot of the assets which were bought at a certain market value. And when the interest rate go up, they lose in terms of value. And if the banks would sell them treasuries and bonds, um, then they would have to pay, uh, they would get a lot of less money and write off losses. And they can't do that. And therefore they keep them on the books as if they would still be valuable papers. So this is obviously uh, um, uh, a problem which does not go away. And, you know, you have the ongoing collapse of the real economy, not so much in the United States, but, you know, given the fact that, you know, we are suffering in Germany still the friendly fire from the, the sabotage of the Nord Stream. And, you know, now we German industry is just collapsing because of high energy prices. And, uh, you know, this will accelerate. So I can see that there will be a lot of social ferment because, you know, when you threaten the very existence of farmers, that, that is happening in Germany, for example, you know, because the coalition government cut the subsidies for fuel uh, and for the farmers, that is just the absolute red line which makes their farming not not sustainable anymore. So they will go on the streets big time in January in coordination with the truck drivers, in coordination with the locomotive uh, drivers. And that will just be the beginning. So I can see that this coming year uh, between the actual problems in the financial system, the social protest against the austerity measures which are being implemented by the different governments, that this will lead to a very, very hot uh, situation. And, you know, we could see, and then you have the de-dollarization going on. This is another major factor in the situation. So we are sitting on a rather, you know, I would say volcano in terms of, 
you know, the financial system. And I can only say the, there would be a way to solve it. Uh, the four, program, four uh, points of my late husband, Lyndon LaRouge, are absolutely applicable to the situation today. They, in turn, are part of my 10 principles for a new security and development architecture. And that is the only way how we can get out of this crisis in a peaceful way. It's possible, you know, it, it would be politically, that's so mind boggling. It would be very easy. All you would have to do is you would call, uh, <clears throat> maybe not call a big public conference in the beginning, but you would have diplomats uh, putting their feelers out, having, you know, a certain amount of discussion among governments ahead of time, and then agreeing that you need that kind of reform and that we have to replace confrontation with cooperation and both china and russia have said repeatedly uh, even putin very recently said that the west you know that there is still a way of you know finding a way of cooperation so if the political will could be mobilized it would be very easy but it does obviously require an educated citizenship who puts uh, political muscle behind these demands we're almost out of time, but I have one more question for you on Germany. Uh, do you foresee a political realignment in Germany, possibly a grand coalition, CDU, SPD, uh, or uh, just can, an attempt to continue to muddle through? Well, <clears throat> there are many people demanding early elections, uh, like Markus Söder of the CSU had demanded it, I think Friedrich Merz from the CDU, has mentioned it. I don't think that that will happen that easily because this present coalition government likes power more than principles, obviously, otherwise they wouldn't have formed this government. Um, they can't get anything through. The disunity is becoming uh, the talking issue everywhere. So a lot of things can happen, unprecedented and unexpected really big changes whereby the government could fall. The problem is that the present opposition does not really offer an alternative. The CDU, CSU, headed by Friedrich Merz and maybe Söder, they have not said or proposed anything which would be in any way different from the neoliberal policies. And, you know, just today, Wolfgang Schäuble died. He was the finance minister for several years. He was a member of parliament for 51 years. He was famous to be the Mr. Black Zero, very much you know, the inventor of the debt break and a lot to do with the Maastricht uh, criteria. All of the policies which strangulated the German economy um, and that spirit is still unbroken. So I think that in the coming year, you have basically the announcement of Sarah Wagenknecht to form a new party. There are also many circuits in Germany discussing that something completely different needs to be done. All of this is not yet, has not yet taken shape, but it will erupt in the coming year. And I can only say that the only way how we can hope to get out of this crisis is that we have to recognize that countries of Europe and of the United States for that matter, we have to cooperate with the global South, with Africa, with Latin America, with Asia. These are 85% of the people on the planet. And the idea that we can for eternity, you know, be the rulers of the world of a unipolar world, subduing these other countries, it's just not going to be the case. This is over and it will never come back. So why not make a positive step to say, let's cooperate with the BRI, uh, with the BRICS, with other organizations of the Global South, and you know, make friends instead of enemies. Well, Helga, as we've just completed a year, which seems to be have been one of the more bleak years on, in record, I want to thank you on behalf of our viewers for your continued optimism and message of hope. Uh, there are solutions, as you point out, and there's no reason why 2024 can't be a year 
in which these solutions are brought to the fore. And it will depend on our viewers, especially taking seriously what, what you've just been discussing. So thanks again, and uh, I'll see you next year. Uh, yes, next year. <laughs>